All right, that's our text this morning. Hopefully you're there in your Bible or you can navigate on your device. John chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 1 through 11. The topic, Jesus foils the plan of the scribes and Pharisees to discredit him by exploiting the woman caught in adultery. The title of our message, You Don't Stone Me, I'm Not One of Your Little Ploys. It's an old song. Remember the song? Who remembers the song? You don't stone me. It's a great song. And a brilliant title. Father, thank you so much for uh, bringing us here together. Week after week, Lord, you are faithful. Day after day, you declare your glory to us, Lord, in various different ways. I want to just relax now, Lord, in a spiritual sense, rest before you. Invite you to be our teacher as you promised. We pray in Jesus' name and those who agreed said, amen. Living on a sailboat docked in a private marina, having a pet alligator named Elvis, driving a Ferrari Daytona Spider, packing a Bren 10 and a shoulder holster, all the while wearing fashionable pastels. Miami Vice made it seem so cool. Vice, of course, is the arm of the police department concerned with immoral activities like sex crimes. I'm pretty certain being among that criminal element isn't as Crockett and Tubbs as it is on film. The sex crimes task force of the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman to Jesus whom they had newly caught in the vice of adultery. It, seen, it reads like a sting operation. She was seized at the opportune moment for them to use her against their real target, Jesus. The woman deserved stoning. Jesus seemed entrapped in a lose-lose situation. Never go up against the Galilean when salvation is on the line. I'll organize my comments around two points. Number one, Jesus stooped to save you. And number two, Jesus is sure to sanctify you. Let's take a look in verses one through nine on his stooping. But first things first. In your Bible, you most likely have a footnote that says something like, the earliest and most reliable manuscripts do not have John 7, 53 through 8, 11. Should we therefore ignore them, overlook them? Well, there's a long but ultimately satisfying answer for those of you who want to dig into how we got our Bible and the scholarly discipline of textual criticism. For our purposes today, two quotes will suffice. One of the strongest advocates that these verses were not originally part of the Gospel of John is D.A. Carson. After he convincingly shows why they were not, he says, on the other hand, there's little reason for doubting that the event here described occurred, even if in its written form it did not in the beginning belong to the canonical books. R.C. Sproul likewise said, the overwhelming consensus of textual critics is that it was not originally part of the Gospel of John. At the same time, the overwhelming consensus is that this account is authentic, it is apostolic, and it should be contained in any edition of the New Testament. I believe it is nothing less than the Word of God. These verses were not in the original Gospel of John, or at least not at this point in the Gospel of John, but they are authentic and apostolic, and they belong in the Bible. Jacob Kelso will be over in the Welcome Center to answer your questions. I'll be doing pastor pours in the cafe, so just want to take care of you that way. So chapter 8, verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. The annual Feast of Tabernacles ended. Jesus and his disciples were camping on the Mount of Olives, as people did. The Mount of Olives, or Mount Olivet, has been a Jewish graveyard for the past 3,000 years. One resource says that the remains of more than 150,000 are there. A great deal of biblical action takes place on the Mount of Olives. It was there that Jesus gave his talk on future events we call the Olivet Discourse. The Garden of Gethsemane is at the base of the Mount of Olives. Jesus ascended into heaven from Olivet, and the Mount of Olives is where Jesus will touch down in his second coming. More to the text, uh, it shows us again Jesus humbling himself, coming from er heaven to earth, uh, going out to the Mount of Olives. Everyone else would be going home. Jesus really didn't have a home to lay his head, the Bible said. He was dependent on the ministry of others 
Uh, and so we'll see in a moment, this is a setup for what John is wanting to teach us about Jesus' humility. And so verse 2, now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. It was the custom for the teacher to sit and the disciples to stand. Jesus sat down, and that would signal that he was going to teach. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. Fornication is consensual sexual intercourse between two people not married to each other. When one or more of the partners having consensual sexual intercourse is married, it is adultery. There are sexual sins. We don't need to list and describe them. In 1986, the Mies Report was published. Anybody remember the Mies Report? Its official name was the final report of the Attorney General's Commission on Pornography. Uh, they were seeking, as I remember, to define pornography in terms of the First Amendment. What does constitute pornography and what violates the First Amendment and all that. Uh, pro they stacked the commission with prominent Christian leaders so that they would get a, a positive Christ-centered result. But these prominent Christian leaders watched hundreds of hours of pornography in order to give these informed opinions. We need only refer to God's standard for human sexuality. Here is a report in 34 words that says everything you need to know. God's gift of sex is to be enjoyed in a biblical marriage between one biological man and one biological woman who are heterosexual and monogamous. Their marriage is a covenant of lifelong companionship. Anything else is sin. And so you don't have to expose yourself to other things to see what is sin. Some worse than others, obviously, but still sin. Caught in adultery means that she was... Uh, uh, hang on, I lost my place now. I got excited there for a minute. All right, here we go. Caught in adultery means she was caught in the act, or as one paraphrase has it, uh, in bed with. Well, with who? The man deserved punishment. This was a sting. They needed only one adulterer in order to discredit the Lord. See, they weren't really dealing with the sin of adultery or the situation between the man and the woman. They only needed one adulterer, and so they most likely let the man go uh, because uh, it would, you know, women had less social prominence in those days. The exploitation of this woman was itself a heinous sin, compounded by the fact that it was perpetrated by the religious authorities. These are your leaders. People are not commodities to be exploited. One way that churches sometimes do this, uh, I, some might disagree with me, but I think it's serious, is uh, they have fundraising campaigns. And uh, many times they hire outside fundraising consultants who guarantee that if you follow their principles, you will increase your giving towards the project. Uh, the problem is, and this is their terminology, you begin to see individuals as giving units. And so instead of a Christian or a congregant or a brother or sister in Christ, you're a giving unit. And you can give more. If you're not giving anything, you need to give something. If you're giving, you need to give more. And so Sunday afternoon after church, there's a knock on your door. Hi, we're the you need to give more committee. I was noticing online what your salary was and 10% of that before taxes would be this and stuff. Well, it's manipulation, it's coercion, but ultimately it's exploiting people. And so anything like that we want to obviously avoid. People are not commodities that can be tapped into. And when they had set her in the midst, no need to over-dramatize this by saying she was naked, disheveled for sure. They said to her teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. She was guilty and deserved the punishment prescribed by the law, notwithstanding that under Roman rule, the Jews were powerless to execute. And so it was kind of a theoretical question in one sense because no one was going to stone her. Uh, they couldn't or else Rome would intervene. Uh, verse 5, now Moses in the law commanded us saying that she should be stoned, but what do you say? Stoning is the biblically prescribed punishment for a betrothed virgin who is sexually unfaithful to her fiancé. It's a punishment to be meted out upon both of the transgressors, according to Deuteronomy. 
Also in Deuteronomy, death is prescribed for unfaithful wives and their lovers, but no method is specified. And so either they're just kind of spitballing here or she was a, a betrothed virgin, which in their culture, if you were betrothed, it was the same as being married, uh, but different penalties or at least different punishments. What do you say, Jesus? One commentator writes, if Jesus disavowed the law of Moses, his credibility would be instantly undermined. If he upheld the law of Moses, he would be supporting a position which would have been hard to square with his well-known compassion. This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. Uh, thinking back to this woman and whoever she was with, uh, apparently they knew that there was going to be adultery, but they didn't stop it. They, they needed it to occur in order to challenge Jesus. These are the worst leaders in the world. Uh, it's just awful when you stop and think about it. What must it have been like in meetings these religious authorities attended trying to come up with ways to undermine the Lord? They were pretty creative. I give them props for that. What if we ask if he pays taxes? And Jesus has a fish with a gold coin come out of the water. And he says, yeah, give to Caesar what is Caesar and give to God what is God's. Ugh. Now they thought they had this adultery thing. You know they remind me of? Wiley Coyote. They've got the thing, and it's foolproof, right, from Acme. Beep, beep. And then it's, a, you know, it's all over. Or for those of you who like Phineas and Ferb, Dr. Heinz Doofenshmirtz, same idea. There's always a villain who just can't get any traction. And so verse 6, but Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Every commentator starts by correctly pointing out that we cannot know what Jesus wrote on the ground with his finger. Then they spend page after page after page presenting what Jesus wrote on the ground with his finger. Let's consider the setting first. We do want to take a look at this. This takes place in the temple. They are standing on stone flooring, not dirt. It would be similar to our tile here. After the week-long uh, Feast of Tabernacles, people coming in and out tracking in dirt and dust and sand uh, before it got to be uh, cleaned, so it wasn't just ground. It wasn't like outside dirt. It was, it was on a surface like this. And so he had very little writing, uh, you know, to take place. And some suggest that Jesus wrote the names of the accusers. And next to their names, their sins. Others say he wrote out the Ten Commandments as the finger of God. And so what I want to ask is this. Have you ever tried to write anything in the dust? Well, sure you have. Wash me. <laughs> but it takes up a lot of room. There's not a lot of other communication on your uh, back window after wash me. And so Jesus is definitely not writing down individual names on a, like you would in a ledger uh, and things like that. It's always best to let the Bible comment upon itself. In the book of Jeremiah we read, and this is from Jeremiah 17, 13, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. If you'll remember, the day before this, Jesus had spoken of a river or a fountain of living waters. The religious leaders were forsaking him, and he was doing writing on the ground. And so an intelligent Jew, a well-read Jew, might have got it just from the body language, but... Uh, what we're looking at here is Jesus in his body language pointing back to Jeremiah 17, 3, where this was predicted. And if you're looking at that and understanding that, this is not a good prediction to be a part of because the Lord is saying, you have forsaken the Lord. Jesus didn't need to write in the dust in an intelligible way. In fact, the word for writing can be drawing. It's where we get our uh, word cartography from. His mere doodling would send them to the passage about writing in the earth. So verse 7, when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her. Whether she deserved to be stoned or not, Jesus altered this no-win situation. Go ahead and stone her, but anyone who picked up a stone was thereby declaring they were a person without sin. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Jesus was seated this whole time. Remember, he was teaching. 
It would seem that he bent down while he was seated. I'm struck by his low stooping then to the ground. And again, body language. He was stooped low before his father in a humbling bow of a servant, handling this situation as commanded. When we look at Jesus in the Gospels, he is fully God, fully man, the God-man, but he has set aside his prerogatives of his deity and is walking on the earth as a man, listening to his heavenly father, doing what the father tells him to do. And in this case, a woman is caught in adultery, brought to Jesus. They're accusing him and her. They're trying to stre uh, you know, stress him out. And the father whispers to him, doodle. Just doodle, bending low to the ground. And then I'll tell you what to say in a few minutes. His doodling is so weird, if we admit it, that we try to suggest what Jesus wrote in order to make his response less odd. We want him to have written the Ten Commandments or something like that because then it makes sense to us. We forget that God uses the foolish to confound the wise and that we are that foolish that he uses. And he calls upon us to do things that are foolish. Almost every character in the Bible was tasked to do something that seemed foolish. Just ask Isaiah when you get to heaven who had to walk around naked for three years preaching. Oh, that can't be true. And so the, the, a lot of commentators say, well, that can't be true. And so they say, well, he, he had his underwear on. Okay, big improvement. <laughs> so tomorrow when you get up and you're having your devotions and the Lord says, I want you to go to work with your uh, naked. He wouldn't say that, by the way. But anyway, uh, and you argue with him and, and, and you get him down to just underwear, that's essentially what Isaiah did. He went out every day and he prophesied and preached in his underwear. In a, it, it wasn't good. You should be able to think of a time God asks you to do something like doodling in the dirt. Or there will be a time coming. Because God has a, a very different way of handling things. Jesus didn't go to the word. Other times he did. He would argue from their word. Uh, from the scriptures and, and use different argumentation and different things like that. But in this case, he did something which is patently foolish. This, is, this woman's life is on the line. My whole ministry is on the line. I'm going to do some doodling. And then I'm going to get up the second time and, and say something profound that the Father has given me to say. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Conscience acts as a moral governor. The Apostle Paul writes that even people who are not yet called by God are still equipped with conscience as a moral guide. Now, over time, your conscience can become violated, seared, or defiled by ignoring it. Among Christians, it must become biblically trained. Your conscience isn't perfect. It's there, but it's not perfect. And so if you're a Christian, you can train it to, to think correctly by filling up on the word of God. But if you're not a Christian, it's easy to lose your conscience over time. And I don't want to get deep into it today. We'll talk about it another time. But uh, regarding what's happening in our country today uh, concerning Roe v. Wade, you're seeing people who have no conscience whatsoever, uh, who are saying absurd, outrageous, outlandish, wicked, evil things. Uh, and, uh, you know, their conscience has been seared as with a hot iron. And uh, you just need to know that this is the type of person we're dealing with. Uh, so what, what do we need? We need the gospel of Jesus Christ. It alone is the power of God unto salvation. And what these people need is a change of heart that can only come with a turning to Jesus. Now, murderous though they were, the scribes and Pharisees still had a conscience. Not one of them would dare, uh, d dare say that he was sinless. Righteous, sure, but not sinless. Jesus was the only one who did not leave, need to leave. He was the only one capable of picking up a stone. In verse 9, one by one meant these scribes and Pharisees left in order of their rank or their importance. And so they couldn't go as far as declaring themselves sinless, but they still ranked themselves by righteousness and who uh, was the most prominent in status and things like that. Two things jump out. Jesus became the woman's advocate. Jesus was without sin. An advocate represents his client before the judge or judges. Jesus argued her case by suggesting uh, all of them deserve some sort of punishment for sin. Jesus exclusively represents guilty sinners deserving punishment. 
not people who are innocent. In the area of medicine, he exclusively uh, treats those who are sick, not those who are well. So he's come to the sick, he's come to these who cannot uh, advocate for themselves, guilty sinners deserving of punishment. But because he is a man and sinless, he can do more than just advocate, advocate rather. He can take the place of sinners. He can die in your place, substituting himself for you in order to satisfy the penalty that you deserve for sin. God thereby remains just for judging sin by his prescribed penalty of death, but he is able to forgive sinners because their debt has been fully paid by Jesus. God is, the, is just and the justifier of sinners. And, and that's the gospel in a nutshell. Uh, Jesus is sure to sanctify, number two, verses 10 and 11. Do you believe that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ? You might want to hold that answer. It's the right answer, but we're going to, as they say, circle back to that question. You like that? I like that. I've been wanting to say that for weeks. When Jesus had raised himself up, verse 8, or 10 rather, and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? One on one. Notwithstanding the value of stadium evangelism and calling sinners forward, not criticizing that, one on one is how you and I are commissioned to reach the world for Jesus Christ. Polls even show that the people who come to stadiums or to churches, they do it because they were personally invited. And so we have several of these one-on-one -on -one conversations between Jesus and sinners uh, that are very insightful and enlightening as to the true heart of God. Because remember, Jesus said, when you see me, you see the Father. And no one can look at this scene between Jesus and this woman and think that the Father in the Old Testament was some cruel deity uh, that was something different than Jesus Christ. Something is wrong on earth. The Apostle Paul put it this way. Humans are filled with unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness. They're full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and evil-mindedness. They are whisperers and backbiters, haters of God. They are violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to their parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, and unmerciful. We would say sin is what is wrong. We need to reintroduce sin as a concept people understand. It was once a powerful descriptor of human behavior, but it's fallen out of favor uh, in terms of uh, other things. Dr. Carl Menninger, called the Freud of America, wrote a book in 1973 that shocked his secular colleagues. It was titled, Whatever Became of Sin. The book was in response to dealing with patients whose mental problems were the direct result of what the Bible called sin. He addressed the idea that we rationalize and glaze over what we used to call sin. The book professes to offer new hope for real emotional health through moral values. Well, we could use something like that today. One way to talk about sin is to emphasize God's absolute holiness. Jesus raised the standard of righteousness to absolute perfection in deed and in thought. That is, of course, impossible for us. That is why we need saving. Verse 11, she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. There are a few translations that say no man, Lord, no mere man condemns sinners. We are sinners because we fall short of the glory of our thrice holy God. It is in that fallen condition, that hellish, hopeless state, that you are drawn to the Lord. He's a man like you, but more than a man, as we've said, he's the God-man, uniquely God in human flesh. He did not come to condemn you. You were born condemned. He came to save you. While we're yet marveling at how much the Bible can say in so few words, we read, Go and sin no more. Jesus telling her to stop sinning indicates she had sinned. Biblical marriage remains in effect regardless what our surrounding culture collapses into. And so Jesus said, yeah, you're a sinner. Adultery is sin. Sexual sin is sin. It's, it's not a revolution. It's not the, you know, the latest thing. It's not uh, progress. It's sin. Telling her to stop sinning was a call for her to repent. She could turn to God from sin and find in her relationship with Jesus the freedom 
from continuing in sin. This is like a personal altar call in, in just a few words. Jesus told her she could be free from sin. She could overcome sexual sin. He told her this before God the Holy Spirit was given to indwell us. How much more can we experience freedom from sin, sexual and otherwise, with God the Holy Spirit in us? Her ordeal was far from over. I don't know if I've ever thought about this before, but though forgiven by God, severe consequences awaited her. Whether she was betrothed or married, she would face the possibility of disgrace and divorce. She would be shunned by everyone in her community. And on top of that, she would be persecuted because she believed Jesus. And so she was a Christian being persecuted on top of uh, being remembered for her sins. Hey there, lonely girl, is how we must take our leave of her. Notwithstanding that there is a typically false Roman Catholic tradition that she was none other than Mary Magdalene, we know nothing more about her after she met Jesus and went to sin no more. I ask the question, do you believe that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ? And of course the answer is yes, it was then, it is now. Not a trick question. But that means we can confidently say this woman was saved. Sometimes you'll read commentaries and they'll suggest that we don't know what happened to her. She, hopefully she stayed saved, but maybe she never got saved. Well, no, she was definitely saved because Jesus started a good work in her. And he was able to say, go and sin no more. That work was going to make progress. If that doesn't convince you, just consider this. Is there any way that Jesus can tell a non-believer, go and sin no more? No, that's not what Jesus says. That's not what we say to sinners, is it? If a sinner is in here today, you know, if, if you're not a Christian, we don't say, hey, whatever's troubling you, just go and don't do it anymore. Well, what about repentance and what about forgiveness and what about some other things like being born again? Yeah, that's right. You, you can't tell that to a sinner. You can, you can tell a saint right after they're saved, now you need to go and in the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll find that it's possible to sin no more. And you know, sin no more... Good summary of what we call sanctification. Salvation is a three-step process. When you believe Jesus, you are saved. You can't get any more saved than the moment you are saved because the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ and he indwells you. And so you are saved from that moment on. Every day afterwards, God is working in you to conform you into the image of Jesus. You're being made more Christ-like, especially as you cooperate. This is the process called sanctification. The process is completed when you are resurrected or raptured, which is called being glorified. You will have a heavenly body that is incapable of sin. So you're saved, sanctified, glorified. Go and sin no more is your daily word from the Lord along with the enabling to obey it that comes from yielding to the indwelling God, the Holy Spirit. Every day when you get out of bed or every night, whenever you get out of bed or however you sleep, maybe you sleep in a coffin for all I know, but anyway, when you get out of where you're sleeping and you wake up, one of the first things that you should think about is I can go and sin no more. Today is the first day of the rest of my going and sinning no more uh, because God said to do that and he's sanctifying me, and it's his power, and I have the Holy Spirit. Now, the Apostle John, who wrote uh, the, you know, the Gospel of John, he will go on in one of his epistles to say, uh, you don't need to sin, but if you do sin, you know, the Lord will forgive you. And you think, what? Well, it's sanctification again. He says, you have the Holy Spirit. Theoretically, if you yielded perfectly to the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't sin, Right? You'd still be a sinner prior to that. You're not going to be, you know, a perfect person. But, uh, but the truth is none of us can do that. But it doesn't matter because God forgives you your sin, cleanses you from your unrighteousness, and you start all over again with a clean slate to go and sin no more. And so that's what, you know, we use all these big words and arguments, but that's what sanctification is. It's you going and sinning no more because of the Holy Spirit. You won't be sinless until you're glorified, but as pastors like to say, you can sin less. Bonhoeffer said, being a Christian is less about cautiously avoiding sin than about courageously and actively doing God's will. Whether it is a Miami vice or a Jerusalem vice, sin is nothing to glorify or to glory in. And so one final question to you if you are a sinner, not a believer. Are you caught in some sin? 
Well, then, if you're a sinner, not a believer, you need to come to Jesus. You, there, maybe there's other things you can do to improve, but you need Jesus Christ. You need his spirit in your life. You need to be transformed. Not reformed, but transformed. And there are many, many Christians here who are saved in their, uh, as an adult who will tell you that they were absolutely shackled and held captive to various habits and uh, sins and substances and whatnot who were immediately set free to walk with the Lord. If you're a believer, then perhaps you should take heart to this quote and will quit. My Lord said, sin no more to a man like me. His words are backed by his power. Though I am utterly unable to sin no more by myself, his word can make even me sin no more. Anyone who has been tormented with sin will receive the command with exceeding gladness. This command gives me joy the moment I receive it with my amen.